So the first thing that we want to be clear on when we're um, filling in these notes that we took on Monday, October 15th, is um, exactly what rows and columns are and like the language that's used around them because we want to make sure we have our vocabulary words. So a row is also referred to as a period or a um, energy level. Right, so if I say it has four energy levels, it's going to be on row four. If I say it has, well, a maximum of four energy levels, it would be on row four. And if I say it's on period seven, that means it's on row seven. And those are the horizontal side to side, like this. Um, don't write that on your periodic table. And then a column is a group. It's also called a family. And that's because the families have similar properties, and so they are in a column, so up and down. And so when we look at the periodic table, we see that there are 18 columns. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Okay? And there are seven rows. There's seven down the side, and then you might be saying, hey, but what about those ones on the bottom? Those ones at the bottom are interesting because they actually belong right here in this, uh, on this heavy green line that I drew, and the reason why they're underneath instead of right in that center spot is literally so that it will fit on the paper. Sometimes scientists do things because there's like this really important scientific reasons and sometimes it's literally just so it can fit on the paper and makes it easier. And so when we're looking at these columns, um, they tell us some pretty important information that we want to have down packed. And so um, one of the first things is valence electrons. So when I'm using the abbreviation VE like that, what that means is it's the shorthand for valence electron. And remember that a valence electron is the electron on the outer energy level. Um, it's all, They're used in bonding, which we'll talk about in our next unit. And so anything in column one is going to use or have one valence electron. It ends in, you know, 1s1, 2s1, 3s1. That that one is its valence electron. Two, or column two, will have two valence electrons. Uh, column 13 is three valence electrons. 14 is four valence electrons. Five valence electrons. You should be getting the pattern at that point. And then 18 is eight valence electrons. Now you might be asking, what about the elements in the D block? And those elements, for example, if we look at something maybe right here, the ending electron configuration would be 4s2, 3d, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6, 7, 8, 8, 8, okay, traditionally. However, sometimes when you have elements that are in the center um, D block area, remember I said D is for difficult, um, is that they don't always follow the rules. So something that you would normally write as 4s2, 3d4 might actually reconfigure and arrange itself to be 4s1, 3d5. And so because it doesn't follow the rules, we don't ask you at the high school chemistry level to know that. Um, if you take AP chemistry or you go into college chemistry, you'll be diving into that. But at this level, you can just trust me and say that you're going to ignore those center um, elements. And so the important thing about the valence electrons, and we've gone over this a lot in class, is those valence electrons tell you whether or not it is more likely to form a cation or an anion. So remember, a cation okay, is a positively charged atom. So cats have paws and cations are positive. And so an anion is negative. It's literally a negative ion. Okay, and so when we look at these, cations are more likely to gain electrons, whereas anions are more like, oh, excuse me, I have that backwards. Cations are more likely to lose electrons and anions are more likely 
to gain electrons, and it's all based on the octet rule. Okay. Now, the key thing about the octet rule is it starts with oct, and oct means is a prefix for eight. And so this means that atoms require eight valence electrons to be stable. And so if they require eight electrons to be stable, they're either going to lose the ones they have to go to the a full shell, like our full energy level below it, or they'll gain some more. And it's all based on what is going to require less energy. So I kind of like to think about it as they like to be all or nothing. They either want to be zero or eight. So for example, anything in column number one over here having one valence electron, well, it could lose that one valence electron or it could gain seven more to get to eight. And it would be a lot easier to lose one. And so it does that. And so it's most likely to form a cation or something in column 17 has seven valence electrons. Well, it would be much easier to just find one valence electron rather than try to lose seven of them. And so it'll gain an extra electron and become negative and become an anion. And so that's why those valence electrons and being able to look at them quickly on the PR table is really useful because knowing whether or not it will be a cation or anion is going to be hugely important when we get to our bonding unit. And so some other things that we want to look at is um, on your PR table there is a staircase. Um, it kind of goes like this down the periodic table and this staircase does great things. It separates our metals from our non-metals and it tells us where the metalloids are. And so there are a couple things. So the first one is we want to talk about our metals. So metals are to the left of the staircase. Okay, all metals, anything to the left of the staircase. So I'm going to highlight what that might look like. So all of these are metals. All of these are metals. All of these are metals down here. So you can see that there is quite a few elements that are metals on the periodic table. And then non-metals... are to the right of the staircase. And so if we were to highlight those maybe in this green color, those would be all of these. Now there is an exception to this rule. Um, hydrogen over here, I highlighted in blue earlier, is actually not a metal, it's a non-metal. So it's to the right of the staircase, except hydrogen which is over there because it has that one valence electron. So even though it's a non-metal, most of its properties are similar to the rest of the elements in column one because of that one valence electron and how it bonds. Now you say, um, Ms. Nichols, there are a lot that you didn't color in the middle. And so I want to look at that. So these elements here that I'm kind of shading in yellow, they're boxes because I can't remember all of their symbols off the top of my head. Okay, these elements here share a line with the periodic or with staircase, and so that means it is a metalloid. So metalloids are on the staircase, and there is an exception there, and that exception is right here, aluminum. So hydrogen and aluminum are our two exception. So on the staircase, except that one, aluminum. And this is because aluminum doesn't have any questions about its identity. It is not a metal, or it's a, metalloids have properties of both, and a, aluminum has only properties of metals. So it is fully part of the metal clan, even though it touches the staircase. Okay. And so that's kind of what I wanted you to grasp. Um, and I guess with the highlight, I'll just kind of leave it there and write over it. But let's talk about the family names. So column number one 
is called the alkali metals. Okay. Column number two are the alkaline earth metals. I ran out of room for the word metals there. Um, anything in columns three through twelve are the transition metals. That's all of these. Okay, and then in groups 13, 14, and 15, uh, chemists got really, really creative. Um, they call this the boron family. And the reason why is because boron is at the head of their family. Um, carbon comes next, so we have the carbon family. And then we have the nitrogen family here. You might be saying, oh, the next one should be oxygen. Okay, so some people call it the oxygen family, but the actual correct terminology is the chalcogens, which is an awkward word. And if I'm mispronouncing it, I'm sorry, you can double check me. I'm horrible at pronouncing words, but that is the correct term for that family. And then we have the halogens in column 17 and the noble gases in column 18. And so, oh, and we can't forget our ones at the bottom. We have the lanthanide series and the actinide series. Actinide series. And together, they're called the inner transition metals. And guys, I bet you can believe why they're called the inner transition metals. It's because they originally go inside the transition metals over here. Okay, and so what you need to know is you need to be able to talk about some distinct properties of each of these families. Well, of the important ones at least that I can tell you you need to know. So for example, the alkali metals are the most reactive metals on the periodic tables. If you actually look on YouTube, you can find videos of the alkali metals being reacted violently with water, making bathtubs go sky high. Um, I think it's a Mythbusters video. You should totally watch it. It's great. Um, anything here, and this is just for fun because I like talking about it, all of these are going to be radioactive, aka they are going to give you cancer. So all the things that you should probably stay away from. Halogens over here, so halogens are the most reactive nonmetals. Okay, and then the noble gases are important because they do not react. And the reason why they don't react is they have eight valence electrons, and according to the octet rule, that's what they need to be stable so they don't gain electrons, they don't lose electrons. They have those eight valence electrons, they're stable, and they stay there. Um, and so this is kind of the, the gist of what you need to know with that. But let's go into more of these like metals versus non-metals thing. And I'm going to use my little rainbow ink here because I thought it was so fun in class. So if we look at our, there we go. If we look at metals and non-metals, okay? We need to look at what are the properties of each of these, okay? So a metal is going to be shiny. Now the appropriate vocabulary word for that would be luster. To, so to say that an element has luster means that it's shiny. So that means non-metals are dull. Metals are going to be malleable. Okay, this means able to bend. However, if you try to bend a non-metal, it is brittle, and that means it breaks easily. So if someone says your hair is brittle, that is not a compliment. It means you need to use some conditioner, get your hair care going on. Okay, um, metals have a high melting point. Okay, the reason why have a high melting point. They have some really strong bonds. And so non-metals have a low melting point. 
Um, and this kind of shows up in many ways. So almost all metals are solids except for mercury, which is element Hg on the periodic table. And that is a liquid at room temperature, whereas nonmetals can be all three. It can be a solid, a liquid, or a gas. However, all of the noble gases are included in there. There are many gases that are nonmetals. There's only bromine, which is a liquid, and the rest are solids, so like carbon, stuff like that. Okay. Um, metals react with acid, and so that means if you pour a little bit of acid on a metal, it's going to like steam and but bu bu bubble, and there will be a color change, all the things we learned about in Unit 1. Whereas the nonmetals um, do not react with acid. However, we're going to see that metals are good conductors of heat and electricity, whereas nonmetals are poor conductors. If you see something called a semiconductor, it means it's kind of in the middle, and that's usually a trait of a metalloid. So, Nonmetals are poor conductors. The last thing which we kind of mentioned is based on like where they are in the periodic table and things like that. Metals are going to form cations, um, and that's because they're going to lose their electrons, whereas nonmetals form anions, and that means they gain electrons. And so hopefully this should be a good review for you of everything that you should know. Um, but one thing that you might want to keep in mind is just like if you list two elements, you can know a lot of information just on what we've talked about. So for example, if I look at lithium, okay, lithium I know is in row two which means it has two energy levels. I know it's number three on the periodic table, so it has three protons, three electrons, and the mass tells me that it's going to have four neutrons. I know that it is a alkali metal. I know that it is highly reactive because the alkali metals are the most reactive metals on the periodic table. I know that because it's a metal, and, well, actually, I know because it's in column one and it's an alkali metal, it has one valence electrons or valence electron, which means it is most likely to form a cation. Okay, I can say all of these things about lithium. Okay, and if I have an element such as fluorine, okay, fluorine is also on row two. Oh, and I would also note it's ending electron or the electron configuration, 1s2, 2s1, right? We've learned that. So it's on row 2, which means it has two energy levels, okay? It is number 9 on the periodic table, so it has 9 protons, 9 electrons, and I believe it has 10 neutrons, okay? We know it's a halogen. It is also very reactive. But Instead of being a metal, it is a non-metal, okay? And I know it has seven electrons, so it's most likely to form an anion. And so what this information is, if we compare, okay, anion to cation, those things are likely to react with each other. Opposites attract. This seven valence electrons requires one more, and lithium wants to give away its one valence electron. They're both highly reactive. And so this means that these are all really good reasons for why these two elements would react very easily together. And so I hope you found this review helpful. Good luck studying for your test.